right, thank you. So, Welcome. I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the West Hartford Public Schools Board of Education meeting for Tuesday, December 3rd, 2019. And uh, Cammie, would you please call the roll? Ms. Aronson? Here. Mr. Levine? Present. Mr. Payson? Here. Ms. Poland? Here. Dr. Steinberg? Here. Dr. Thomas Farkason? Here. Mr. Zdanowitz. Here. Thank you. And I'll just uh, let the public know that because we're having a board meeting on a day that was a snow day for our students and teachers, uh, we have um, graciously excused our student representatives, uh, Isabella Gom and Kenya Ferreira. And so I'd like to ask uh, board member Ari Steinberg to lead us in the pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag. The United States, States of America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I do not believe we have a revision to the agenda order this evening and no student participation. So we'll head to public communications and has anyone signed up to speak? Okay. Uh, moving on to unfinished business, we have an item under new business, ratification of the local 130361 of Council 4 AFSME Maintenance Employees Union. Uh, the recommendation is that the Board of Education ratify the negotiated agreement between local 130361 of Council 4 AFSME Maintenance Employees Union and the Board of Education for the period of July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2022. Good evening, everyone. Um, before you for approval is a ratified agreement between the Board of Education and our maintenance union. Our maintenance union is one of our smaller units. It's uh, comprised of about 20 individuals who are responsible for the general maintenance of all of our school, f school facilities. It includes uh, electricians, uh, plumbers, HVAC personnel. Uh, we have a carpenter. We have a painter. Uh, we have actually the print shop. There's two individuals in the print shop who are part of this union as well. And then we have general maintenance and um, grounds maintenance employees as well. The contract you're voting on right now is a five-year contract. It goes retroactive to July 1st of 2017. Calls for wage increases in that first year of 2017-18 of 2%. So it would be a general uh, wage increase of 2% retroactive to July 1st of 2017, a retroactive wage increase of 2.2% to July 1st of 2018, a 2.25% in each of the next three years, and the contract would expire on June 30th of 2022. Um, with this change, we've agreed to health care and dental changes that all of our other bargaining units have agreed to over the past year, which we've discussed at this table, and that is the move to the Connecticut State Partnership Plan. And that is essentially a plan that allows municipalities from around the state to join the state health plan. Um, and with this plan, uh, our employees and dependents are subject to a rigorous wellness program, which we've talked about as well which includes annual preventive visits. It includes um, cholesterol screening, uh, mandatory breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, uh, annual colonoscopies, all at certain ages. Um, also for individuals who have certain conditions like heart disease or diabetes, they'd be required to participate in a disease education uh, program and a counseling program. For employees who don't, or dependents who don't adhere to that wellness program, they will be subject to penalties, which would include an additional $100 a month in uh, premium, as well as be subject to annual deductibles of $350 per individual and $1,400 per family. 
as we've discussed in the past, this plan is going to provide us with a little bit more financial stability than we've experienced in the past. There are year-over-year -year increases in the state partnership plan have averaged about 2%, uh, two percentage points lower than our year-over-year -year increases for the Board of Ed health plan. And it'll also provide with a lot less fluctu um, fluctuation from year to year as well. In addition, our retiree health care costs are going to be cut in half through this plan as well, which has provided significant savings. When you include all of our bargaining units, it's about $2 million in savings uh, with the retiree health care piece. Uh, in addition, our employees will contribute about 30% more over the course of this contract for their health care costs. And um, there's also significant pension reform included in this contract as well as our employees will contribute about 75% more in uh, contributions towards the pension plan. Um, the only other change uh, with this contract is the um, safety shoe allowance. Uh, right now it's $175 a year, and we will increase that $175 to $200 a year for safety shoes. And that summarizes uh, all of the changes with this contract. We'd be happy to answer any questions that the board had. So, uh, Rick, how many employees does this represent? 20. 20? Yeah. And it does, I guess I, I don't remember this, and maybe I asked this question in the past, but do they support just the school systems, or is this a town-wide uh, combined um, piece? So it's just the school system, um, although our ground, I mentioned that we have grounds maintenance within the maintenance union, so they actually report out of the public works department, so they do assist a little bit. Um, on the town side, but mostly it's school related. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? If not, I'll try your minds. All those in favor of approval of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay? Abstentions? The ayes have it. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item number six, staff communications and reports, and starting with the superintendent's report. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just, this is gonna come earlier than typically. Every year I try to talk about once we're around the snow season, what goes into it so the people watching can understand um, the request and ask any superintendent or Dr. Morrow people that are involved and we all wonder this time of year why we didn't choose a uh, school system down south, um, especially when you get back-to-back -back days. So typically um, what happens is Andy and I start communicating with each other and with Bob Palmer. Um, at between 3.30 and 4, depending on the day, depending on the situation, after going through the reports the night before. We get the same weather reports um, that our Department of Public Works get. And then what happens is Bob comes over the mountain from Simsbury and checks the roads in the north end of town. Depending on the situation or the time, there are times Nandy and I would leave our house to go and check the roads if needed. There's times where it's clearly not needed, the past couple days being examples where it's there's decisions that are a little, well, a little different about being made both days. And um, Bob is also in touch with, um, with Department of Public Works, getting estimates for us about, okay, how long will this take to clear? Then we also have to think about how long will it take to clear all the school parking lots? And, are the school lots needed for anything within town otherwise? Then we also have to think about how long will it take residents to remove the sidewalk um, issues. And residents have 24 hours, but like in a morning like this morning, with the idea being, okay, it's stopping now. There was one more band coming through. Andy and I were talking like 4.30. It had stopped a half an hour before, but there was another band coming through at 5.15. That was a strong band. And... It's just one of those, is it reasonable to expect 11 inches of snow to be cleared for kids to be walking through half mile for elementary, mile for middle, mile and a half for high school? And um, also, 
the main roads and the Department of Public Works does a great job in West Harvard. And this is something I've said over the years, that our situation is a little different than some of the smaller towns. Now, our bigger roads, wider, and our Department of Public Works is great. But then you look at the side roads, and then you go up by Avon Mountain, up by where you live, Mark, and you go up by um, the skating rink in those areas over there, and then it becomes a little more tenuous in terms of our buses. Now, the one thing I'll say to people, I never worry about kids on buses. They, they are, those things are tanks. They have chains that will drop if necessary. But if a bus gets stuck on a hill, it can't just back up. By law and practice, we, the police have to be there when buses back up like that on a main road. So it's, it can lead to delays and lead to snarls. And then we also have the impact of talking to the Department of Public Works about what are you hearing? When will this be? Do you want cars off the road by rush hour and everything else? So, for example, like Monday, we have these conversations and all of our best information says it's going to taper and be a very light snow if snowing at all during the day and that there's a hole in the snow that's going to come between 1 and 4 o'clock. That hole didn't really happen. The roads were warm enough that the roads were safe to drive. We had no issues with buses or anything else, thank God. But that doesn't mean Andy and I aren't worried all during the day. And it certainly doesn't mean we're not second-guessed on things. And then a day like today, where it's actually a little easier decision, even though you know that at 9.30 you're going to be outside, it's going to be sunny, it's not going to be snowing at all, and you're going to think, well, they could be in school right now. But there's the removal. The one other group that I do to talk to, and because... Again, West Hartford is different, but one thing has shifted a little bit too, and that's, I talked to the Farmington area superintendents also at this time, because weather is an act of God. An accident caused by weather is, an act, is just an accident. There's a legal question argument that if every other school system closed and you stayed open, and then there were an accident, that that theoretically could make you liable for that. So that's something else that goes into the discussion with the other superintendents. Not that you make a decision based on what other people are doing because the weather in Canton is typically very different than the weather in roads in West Hartford. But just to give people a window into that, and I know the right time to call people is a question people have. What When we, at first we said we'd call at six o'clock and we had so many requests from people that said, can you make the calls earlier? Because to organize daycare and everything else, the sooner we know, the better it is. So we do. We call as soon as we know. But then again, there are times when that leads people to say, why are you calling so early? And there is a way people can opt out, but they'd be opting out of our communication. Um, there is so many ways now that people aren't sitting by the radio um, which I used to do in Boston, listening and waiting to hear West Harf, and then if you missed it, wait another 20 minutes. Um, I, it's People tend to find out pretty early. The other thing is we need to let our teachers know the commute from a distance away as soon as we can. So that's kind of the protocol that we go through if people have questions. Both myself and Dr. Morrow are willing to um, talk on the phone about it, but... Um, that is what snow days are like, um, which is miserable. Um, but um, one thing that we also do think about is what does it mean for kids with the day off? Like, I know people act like, oh, you're trying to get a day in for June. That is, That has never in my life been a part of the thought process, whether... I, I'm working June 25th anyway. Whether the kids are in or not, I understand the pressure. It's really just about safety. One thing that we do know from people and one thing we try to make sure of, and this storm isn't typically a good example of, but usually the first snow that there's any snow, people are like, why are you having school if it's snowing? And it's there's going to be times where it's snowing we have school. And we want the same call to kind of hold true on December 5th, that would happen on March 5th, um, just for consistency so people can understand. We used to get way more calls complaining when we canceled school. 
those calls don't happen nearly as much anymore. And I don't know if it's because people just take that to Facebook, but um, I think I think people tend to want to err significantly on the side of caution now more than they certainly used to. That's my impression anyway. So that's that. Um, since our two um, representatives from the high schools can't be here tonight, I would say that the Saturday before Thanksgiving was a really good community event day in West Hartford. First, the football game, which brings out, you know, a few thousand people just really to talk, people that aren't necessarily as invested in the game, but it was a great game, won on the last play by Connard. But Hall didn't have to stay sad too long because that night in New Britain, Hall won the boys' soccer state title um, for Class Double L. So that was that was a really good day and two fun events um, for our community to be a part of. And I guess the next thing would, they would say is winter sports are starting this week and tryouts and hockey and everything. And good luck to all those. And of course. Um, December is the time for winter concerts, whether it be madrigals, whether it be the uh, the elementary schools, but try to go out and see our kids perform. And Friday at Hall is the Unified Theater performance, um, Friday night. Unified Theater has two performances. The largest one is in the spring at that involves both high schools, Connard and Hall. There's a smaller one in the fall that is more hall folk gets held at hall um so this is this friday it is a great event um i will say unabashedly my favorite events of the year are the unified theater shows um so with that that's a report thank you uh moving on to item b staff reports and board discussions and the first item is equity for excellence election day professional development review Good evening, everyone, and welcome officially our newest board members. I am thrilled that the weather cooperated so that we could be here this evening uh, to share with you an update on our equity, diversity, and inclusion work. I'm happy to be here with present company, and we're, tonight's presentation will highlight the recent Election Day Professional Development Equity for Excellence um, PD district-wide. So I'm pleased to have joining me this evening, Senior May Leon, uh, Principal of Charter Oak International Academy, no stranger to you all, and Conard High School Senior Jewel. Both were heavily involved in the Election Day professional development planning and were workshop presenters. And both are very instrumental in supporting our cultural competence development. So in just a moment, I will share my airtime with both of them, but I just wanted to provide you with a little context that led up to this day and this work. In 2016, you may remember that Superintendent Moore articulated a clear and bold vision and long-term commitment to building our cultural competence and strengthening our own cultural humility. And uh, he established the Equity and Diversity Council, the EDC which I'm honored to be able to co-lead. And it's been, over those past three years, we've been engaged in very meaningful, complex, and rewarding work uh, to better understand our changing culture and how to best be responsive uh, to our students and families. So we've adopted this definition of cultural competence, and we move through in and out and throughout a continuum of cultural consciousness, responsiveness, and advocacy. And it's essentially West Hartford Public Schools having ways to acknowledge, respect, and honor and respond to the differences, across, cultural differences of our students and our families. So in April 2019, this past spring, the Equity and Diversity Council, in collaboration with the Professional Learning and Evaluation Committee, designed 
a professional development needs assessment relevant to cultural competency. We felt that over the past three years, we've been doing a lot of steady and focused work, but we really needed to pause and take stock of where we are and where we need to go. And so we had 700, over 700 professionals respond to uh, this professional development needs assessment. And what we found was uh, more than just the responses, high need, moderate need, low need, it was the commentary, overwhelming commentary that really shaped and guided the, and charted our course ahead. And so we identified through the disaggregating the information of uh, some professional priority growth need areas, eliminating barriers. We're working towards systemic equity, developing and delivering a culturally relevant and responsive curriculum, just being better, being more welcoming in our schools, being inclusive and increasing diversity within the WHPS certified staff. So those were the priorities that seemed to uh, come out that emerged from that needs assessment. So with that, we proceeded to, we started thinking, why would we go outside to bring people in to educate us and share their knowledge and skills? When we invest in our educators, we really invest in them. We, when we send them out for workshops and trainings, we're very judicious about that. We have them apply to attend and we ask them, what are you gonna bring back? Why do you wanna do this? What can you turn key and bring back to help us to grow and be better? And so we said, why not just open an invitation to our own educators who are so passionate and eager to share their learning, their knowledge and expertise that they've gained with their colleagues. We invited them to offer a workshop, to, su to get, submit a workshop proposal. And so with that, these were the themes that emerged, anti-bias, culture responsive practice, ELL learners, LGBT topics, uh, racial justice and racial equity, systemic equity and social emotion and learning were the key buckets on which 35 workshops fell under. And so we also realized we are so strongly supported. We have great resources with our community partners, so we invited them to the table. We invited them to be participants, presenters, and to host resource tables during the lunch hours so that our educators could uh, interact with them and learn from them. We, in fact, we, I got an email today uh, from uh, Fern Street Food Ministry. They had a table, and they said as a result of that, they now have new volunteers, teachers and students who are now volunteers as a result of their presence at that workshop. So we kicked off the day. Superintendent Moore actually kicked off the day by uh, you know, just really restating our purpose. You know, you don't know your what if you don't know your why. So he really inspired us with a message and uh, followed by a police chief, West Harvard police chief Vernon Riddick also reaffirmed his commitment to supporting our work. And then we were uh, led and inspired also by Aran Nazario of the Peace Center. He's done work at both Charter Oak and Conard High School with our students uh, just to build peace. And this was a quote from him, just, you know, just, reminding that every teacher has that power to, to help, to harm or humiliate or give hope to our students. And so we can be that beacon of hope, we're reminded. And uh, we write, Kenya was also uh, one of our guides. We, we had the support of our paraprofessionals and TAs and we just wanted them to help us to be workshop hosts make sure that everything went well in those workshops so that our participants could get everything that they needed from it. And I was so pleased that our paraprofessionals, our TAs, and our students like Kenya took it very, very seriously and also participated in the survey and the evaluation at the end and gave us some good feedback. And so I wanted to have Senior Melian here tonight because he was a workshop presenter, but he also brings with him this institutional memory um, dating back to his time at Conard and then at Sedgwick and at Smith and at Charter Oak over the years of how our culture has changed and why we must too. So I welcome him to share his reflections. Good evening. Great to be here with uh, Joao and certainly Rosina. And uh, next couple of slides uh, deal with the numbers. Probably nothing uh, new to you. As you can see, when we look at our 
uh, certify staff as mostly teachers, we see that uh, the representation of uh, color staff is about uh, 9%. That is not too different uh, from the state average. Actually, I believe it's exactly the state average is 9%, so there, we cannot see uh, any difference there. Uh, whites is 91%. Uh, uh, when we look at uh, our students, that would be the next slide, uh, we we'll see uh, that our students represent 42% uh, percent of our student population. Uh, the state is a little bit higher than that, 46, but again, we don't see a huge difference either. So as you can see, uh, in, in our case in West Hartford, we have that 42% uh, versus the 9%. So we can safely talk about an underrepresentation of uh, staff of color, uh, teachers of color uh, in our schools and in state uh, as a whole. Uh, and that's uh, what, uh, caught my attention in, in looking at uh, this data, and we presented in our workshop uh, under the title and the representation of educator of course in, in West Hartford Public School. So we look at this topic and we share uh, with uh, our audience uh, numbers similar to the ones uh, you're seeing, a little bit of the science behind and the benefits of having uh, staff that looks like our children uh, in our classrooms. Uh, we also uh, took a look at the great efforts uh, our uh, district is uh, having uh, to change, uh, to correct that situation. And we also shared something that was very powerful to all of us on perspectives. Perspectives uh, from parents, uh, perspectives from uh, educators of colors. I had a lot of conversations, and my partner, Christy Burton, who is a Charo Oak, is a, she's a third grade teacher. We met with a good number of uh, staff of color across the district, and certainly the perspective of uh, the students, but Joao can talk more a little bit about that. But why don't we take a listen, uh, take a look at the video and that is up there. Uh, this is a parent of elementary school, Charo Oak and I think what she says uh, is powerful. So I would say that representation on a personal level is really important to me because I have a six-year-old in school. Um, and I can share that when she was first born, I spoke to her in exclusively Spanish. So that was the only language she knew. We would tell jokes, sing songs, um, obviously have conversations all in Spanish. And once she started school, um, her first year, she was actually really lucky because she went to a school with a majority of Spanish-speaking staff. So they kind of continued that. And then when she transitioned to a new school, she had a majority of English-speaking staff. And she lost a lot of that Spanish to the point where now that she's six, she really doesn't speak Spanish. So I would say representation in the sense of having a teacher that looks like you, can speak your language, has shared some of the struggles that you have, really, really forms that connection and that deep, really deep sense of holding on to your traditions and to a part of who you are, or where you come from and how you identify with the world. So that's why I would say it's important to me. Other parents talked about uh, the notion of validation, uh, role modeling, which I think is uh, pretty obvious to everybody, but also one of the parents shared with me the idea that is uh, having uh, somebody who looks uh, like your child uh, in the classroom is really uh, counteracting negative images that uh, you know uh, African Americans or Hispanics are usually portrayed in media and in other settings. So it's powerful. Our families know that, and our families noted that there is an underrepresentation uh, in our classrooms. Uh, we also look at uh, how our staff feels our teachers, our assistants, our TAs, our paraprofessionals. And I have, I'm, I'm very, you were mentioning in my uh, historical perspective, 23 years here, it gives me that. Uh, but um, I have to say that uh, everybody is truly proud to be uh, working West Hartford Public School. Everybody uh, we talk to, 
uh, staff of color in West Hartford, they all shared uh, with us, with Christy Berger and myself, the idea that this is a great district, that they feel appreciated, they feel supported, and uh, they work in great environments across our school. So that is important uh, to say. But uh, some topics, some thoughts, some ideas emerge in every conversation we had with them. So I want to just mention a few of them uh, so you know, and, and we discussed them in our workshop and on election day. Is there is this need, this constant uh, comments from our colleagues of color saying the constant need to prove yourself. That is a feeling that you hear all the time when you take the time to sit down with teachers of color. They feel the need to prove themselves all the time. There's also the notion of a code switching, which is an interesting one. Uh, usually it's used when uh, we talk about languages, but in this context it's the idea that probably I should change a little bit my practices, my approaches, so I conform a little bit better uh, with the people I'm dealing with in the work setting. So code switching with was another idea that we heard uh, co uh, across our conversations with our colleagues. Uh, one that also emerged as a clear uh, thought uh, from our colleagues is the idea that there is no dialogue on the concept of white privilege, uh, that it exists. Uh, we don't talk about that. Uh, we don't talk a lot about it in our school settings but it's something that is noticed by uh, our colleagues. And uh, also, uh, the message from them is, it's okay to check with us. How are you doing? Is everything okay? Certainly we do that with every staff member in our schools, but there's some uniqueness. There's some things that are different for the, uh, with the educator for colors that uh, this question is absolutely pertinent and we should all make an effort to check how are you doing because the, the issues uh, that we are addressing as uh, educator for colors are slightly different. So next time you see somebody, how are you doing? Everything is okay and it will be very appreciated. Uh, I'm going to let Joao to talk a little bit about the students' uh, perspective, but uh, uh, in our workshop we also had uh, some interesting uh, videos uh, that we recorded with students, and, and I was really uh, surprised uh, to listen to them, and in both cases seniors. We decided to talk to seniors in high schools, and in both cases, the uh, students of color said that the first teacher uh, who looked like them was when they were sophomores in high school after many years in our, in our school. So that's the reality. Uh, we are not unique about it, as the data shows, but that's something that we need to take into account and, and as we work to uh, correct that situation. Thank you, Mr. Malian. Um, that workshop validated the feedback and the oversubscription, the over enrollment um, for that workshop validated the work that we're doing and also confirmed that there is such a need. Um, so it was important to hear parent voices, to hear our educators' perspective. We're here for students, and so we did not want to leave their voices out. And so Joel is here to talk with us about, share his reflections uh, on his workshop experience and in the work that he's doing too. Good evening everyone. Um, I participated in the workshop and it was an amazing experience for me because in the three years that I've been living in America, I've never had the opportunity of sharing my feelings or sharing my story with anyone besides my mom. And it was really, I, at first, I, I was really shocked because while talking to the teachers and telling them my experience and for example how I I have I take care of the bills for my mom I am the one who calls um, for the insurance they were they didn't they they didn't know anything about that and they were really shocked and for me it's something that's normal but I realized that for most of like for most of the people here they don't they don't they don't know that and being able to share 
share my point of view, share, not only mine, but from all of the immigrant students in my school, be able to share my point of view to them and show them what it is to be an English learner in an American high school. Not only that, but our experience out of, outside of school. And one of the things that we talked about in the workshop that I think was really important, I mean, that I, it was really important for me, it was at first the teachers were started asking questions and they asked us what is um what would you what would um be one of your advices to help so american students or uh immigrant students connect with each other since they don't know english or they don't know the language and i at first i, I didn't know how to answer that question i was really really confused but then i thought i have a little brother and he he didn't speak English too, and at first he didn't have friends, and he started playing games. That's why that's why <coughs> I told them my brother started playing games and made a lot of friends. And for a lot of people, that games might be not a good idea, <laughs> but for my brother was something that helped him in a tremendous way. He made friends in school that he never thought he, he would have made. And being able to see that, being able, just being able to see like how teachers were caring about us and asking questions, asking, especially one of my, um, she's a nurse in, our, in Connor High School, and she she was asking, she was she was saying that a lot of students, the first um, person that the students see in the school, it's basically the nurse, where they get their physical, not their physical, but like where they get checked and stuff. And she was asking, how do I make them feel comfortable? How do I make them feel welcomed? And that, that, that meant so much to me because she, she was the first, first person that I saw when I got there. And she tried everything that she could to help me. And being able to not only teach her, but teach the other, other teachers about how to help students like me feel welcome in school, it was really, it was an amazing experience. It was really important for me. Because, as I said, I've never had this opportunity. <laughs> and it was, it was really special because it's my senior year and next year, hopefully going to college and be able to leave this, this um, mark, this knowledge behind for the teachers, and especially my brother's coming, it's gonna, soon uh, study at Connor and I, I want to be able to help the teachers help my brother. Not only my brother, but all of the other students that are struggling like I did. Thank you. Wow, thank you. You know, it is so important for all of our students to have their narratives and hear their histories and see their experiences up front in the context of teaching and learning. And Joel helped our teachers to recognize that and certainly had an impact on the day and it emerged in the evaluation. There were well over 200 people that we could have brought here um, to the table just to share their experiences and why this work is important and the impact that it had. Um, you know, we've shared a couple of graphs where the purple is feedback about the morning sessions Juan's session as well as Joel's session, the student voices. Uh, purple represents strongly agree and green agree and you know some other people not there yet. Um, we didn't figure it out for them yet but we will. We'll keep working at it. Um, but just I wanted to also share, we asked them what are some things you're going to commit to? What are you going to do tomorrow? You know and teacher the feedback, the optional feedback was overwhelming. Uh, over 400 comments about, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to take away. I think hearing student voices was really important so for many of our educators. They're going to reflect on their own biases. For, for educators to admit that they have bias, we all do, but sometimes it's hard to admit. Um, even with good intention, we have bias. Uh, and here's one, in my many years, my humble opinion, it's simply, the, it was simply the absolute best PD experience. Um, and this educator felt respected. 
Um, and, and we, you know, we did our research too, and we sent people out. We don't just ask them in their trainings, what's, what are you going to turn key? What are you going to bring back? But we asked them, how did it make you feel when you were there? Um, what was the atmosphere like? And so we used a lot of, um, we drew on a lot of the great uh, workshops and conferences put on by other large organizations such as College Board, um, Capital Region Education Council, CERC as well, uh, to design this. And so these are our next steps. We've got work to do. We won't, be, we won't ever be status quo. Um, we're just going to keep moving ahead um, and being bold, and we're just we're fortunate to have a leader that's right out there and in front of it, and clears our paths to do our best work. Um, there's so much more that we can say. We want people to be involved. We want you all to stay informed. We want the public to stay informed. Give us feedback. Um, and so we've got some platforms and resources, the Equity and Diversity, the EDC Monthly Digest. There's a lot more about the Election Day that's on there in video and pictures. Um, and uh, next, we're going to be looking forward to strengthening our family and school partnerships, too. So I'd like to thank my presenters. I also, I would be remiss if I didn't give a nod to Amanda Goler, who's in the audience today. She's our ESL family, um, our family outreach specialist. And she is really elevating our work. She goes above and beyond to make connections with families, to make them feel welcome, and to empower student voices. We couldn't do this work without her, and so I'm grateful to have her as well. We'll open the floor for any questions and discussion. So, uh, very good presentation. <coughs> I was uh, speaking to a teacher right after election, and it was about the election, and uh, congratulations, this, that, and, and unsolicited, she said what a great time she had during this um, PD. And, you know, I didn't even ask her about it. And she she knows I'm on the board, but uh, she couldn't speak. She said it herself was probably one of the better ones that she's been to. And I wasn't surprised, quite honestly, because I, I know you guys do a knock-up job. So... Um, but unsolicited, usually you got to kind of crawl, uh, claw some of that stuff out of people. Oh, tell me about your experience. How was it? You know, but um, couldn't speak up more enough about their their day, um, the entire day for professional development. So um, I just want to kudos to your continued work and appreciate it. And uh, and we know that things are getting done without even having to have these presentations because uh, you do such a great job. I just wanted to um, second what Mark said. Um, I want to thank you for um, really kind of addressing um, some really difficult issues. Um, it's valuable work that you do in a very timely, in you know, in this political um, environment. It's a, it's very timely as well. Um, the other thing I want to say is I want to commend you um, for sharing your experiences because that's that takes a lot of courage, um, and it makes you really vulnerable. Um, but I think it's really important information for educators and administrators to hear, um, because you are the true, um, you know, you are the true experience. To so to share that um, with the adults around you is 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 so valuable. So I applaud you for um, getting up there and sharing that with um, whoever was in that room, and and for sharing it with us today. So thank you very much. Hi. Um, I just share Dr. Steinberg's feelings as well as I'm sure we all do. And I want to thank you for all of this work. I mean, we, we knew that this was going to be our professional development day, but going through our reading that we get on Fridays to see the depth of that what went into planning this and how involved this was, this was a tremendous amount of work, clearly. So thank you for that. Um, I think we may have talked in the past. I'm not sure if you remember, but um, I've been close to this work over the years through my work regionally and have been involved with doing hundreds of interviews of faculty, staff, students around issues that relate to this topic. And I can tell you that everything that you said, Senor Melian, is what they talked about, especially <clears throat> not only how valuable it is for students, but the support system that's to have a support system in place for faculty when they're joining different districts, um, because sometimes that can be that struggle that happens two, three years in where 
people might be spread out around the district and the support system per school may differ from place to place. So the fact that this was so successful really speaks to what you've already done as well because in most districts you're not getting this kind of a response because this is very layered work and having been through it as a faculty member, <coughs> excuse me, as a white person, I can tell you that it's years of layering and layering and layering and so it's really special that you've already done what you've done in order to have this be so successful but to be planning it so far ahead and to be keeping it on the forefront of your work is going to be more important for our students than ever. So thank you for that as a parent, um, but I just, what you were talking about really resonated and what you're experiencing here is very different from what's happening in other districts and I think that's something that is going to benefit our whole entire community um, as time goes on, so thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation, especially Joelle, you did a great job. Um, I really like how you involve the students. I've been, I'm an educator and I've done a lot of equity training over the last few years and we didn't involve the students, we didn't involve the community, so whoever, whoever's idea that was, that was really impressive. Um, I also w went over and looked through the website that you, you had a screen capture of and watch the videos and uh, it, it's just packaged really well. I, I was so inspired I immediately emailed Tom and said how do I get involved with this. Um, so it's just a fantastic job that you guys have done. I know a lot of West Hartford educators and they had nothing but positive things to say about their day. So thank you. I have to say it was I appreciate hearing all of the feedback from my colleagues here. Uh, I say that as a board member and also as a person of color. I think many times you, you sometimes uh, are led to believe that you are the spokesperson and you get tired of that. So it was nice to sit back and, and hear the feedback and the comments from my colleague, most imp colleagues, uh, and, and great, most importantly, just the presentation of the work that was done. Uh, so, so, so of value and so, so, so appreciated. And I appreciate how it was approached from many layers and many levels and certainly highlighting the importance of the work being done with our district, not at or to our district, and especially touching on the bias. I think it's important for people to recognize what they have going on within themselves and the lens in which they interact with others and saw that language uh, interwoven throughout the written material. And I very much appreciate as well the use of equity, that word being used, uh, as opposed to equality. I think many times people use those two words interchangeably and there's a difference. So you were quite consistent throughout in referencing the word of equity because that's certainly is something that we all must aspire to do. So thank you so very much. Thank you, colleagues, for all valuing this work, and please continue doing what you're doing. And young man, proud of you. Go ahead. All right, nice. I had uh, just had a question about, so, so. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's, <laughs> I, uh, I, I noticed the data that you showed about our staff, and um, ironically enough, I was in the, in the picture. And one of the back rows. So I know I know pretty well, and I wasn't surprised that you said that people had not seen maybe a person that looked like them until their sophomore year. So I was wondering, um, since I don't I don't know what the data might be at lower levels. Do you know anything about is it is it ex is it extremely different? Because I know the high school data because I've seen it. I don't know elementary and middle school. And from what I've seen from research, is it it's really important that a kid get some connection to a teacher that looks like them. So I was wondering what you know about it and what efforts we're, we're, we're trying to do about that. Hiring is essential. Uh, I can probably Rosina or Tom could speak uh, to the district level, but I can tell you my experience in the past uh, five years. At Charok, uh, we have hired uh, for grade level teachers, uh, two African-American teachers. Uh, also for grade level teachers, we have hired two Hispanic teachers. Um, we have hired a music teacher who is Hispanic. We have hired our school psychologist is an African American. And our social worker is a Hispanic. And that is remarkable. And that has happened in a pretty uh, short period of time. So hiring is key. Uh, having representation of minority in those hiring committees is something that I would encourage every school to do. 
uh, it brings some lenses uh, and, and it's important to do so. And uh, I can tell you that uh, the quality we're hiring is excellent. And let me add, uh, this uh, type of work has an impact immediately on our work. Uh, I can tell you that as we discuss our budgets uh, in, at the school level, our teachers are asking for literature that uh, becomes those uh, windows and mirrors that we talk about. Or when we uh, discuss um, professional development and, and input from the staff, they are telling us they want more of this. So it does have an impact immediately uh, when we discuss uh, goals for the year. Uh, our teachers are saying, I want to reframe my literacy block with the, this new perspective. So this is the actual work. This is what makes a difference in every school. So it pays off, you know, but uh, certainly uh, hiring, uh, I think, is uh, the key here. Yeah, a little more context. This is, and thanks to Ricky, the work he's done. 20, well, five years in a row with 25% of our new hires have been people of color. So, but when you think about that, you're, you know, that's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 per year. And so context, you picked up on something exactly right, Sean. The thing with the elementary, as we make this push, we have 32 less elementary classrooms than we did eight years ago. So it's not just we haven't been able to replenish in the same way. We don't have early career teachers at the elementary level in the same way. And we haven't, that hasn't been hit by the efforts in the same way at the high schools where there's been no population decline there is more natural turnover, so that's been able to happen at the secondary level more than it has at the elementary level. But it's something we're certainly hoping to do as we go through retirements and shifts over time. And it is a focus, as Juan brought up, when we do have openings. So the one place that has had openings has been Charter Oak because we've expanded from a 320-person school to a 520-person school. So during that time, that's been a unique focus of Juan, and it's been successful thanks to his efforts. Just, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you guys want to leave really badly. <laughs> but I, it might be a good segue, too, for some of the new Board of Ed members about the program we have at Central and that you've developed and, and Zena helps with. And yes. So we do have a program. We decided, we know that our teacher diversity shortage, it's not unique to West Hartford, but we didn't want to wait for something to be done about it, so we decided to take action. We recognize that we have students of color, high school students of color, who aspire to be educators. Like our educators inspire them to want to become educators in the future. And so we tapped into uh, those students and we started a program called the Future Educators of Diversity, both at Conard and at Hall High School. Uh, and so we have partnerships with our local colleges that mentor, support our students, uh, give them incentives, help them with the um, application process. So CCSU, our formal um, partnership with them is the Blue Devil Direct Project. And so they mentor their college uh, professors and administrators, mentor our students. Uh, they bring them in for college visits. For some of them last year, um, during our college visit when we had the rollout, it was the first time some of our seniors had ever been on a college campus and said, I can imagine myself there, and at least two of them from that program are there now. So we're looking for them to return and be educators here too. Uh, when they've finished their requirements, certification requirements, their you know, college requirements, uh, they're invited to come back for an interview. They're guaranteed an interview. But CCSU is providing the opportunity for um, early decision, financial aid, and scholarship access, and, and you know assistance with the college application and getting them to just imagine themselves, especially the first generation students on a college campus. So it's a thriving, thriving and robust program that we're expanding. Um, I think we have over 42 students at both schools. Uh, I can't say that all of them say that they want to be an educator, but they I call them the imposters because they found a place where they feel like they're heard, where they feel like they belong. And so we hope that we'll inspire them too to become educators and come back to West Hartford. If I could before they leave, <laughs> because they're gonna get up. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, because as superintendent, um, but as a human being, 
I always try to write a Thanksgiving message to staff about what I'm thankful for. And you have the three people here that probably in West Hartford Public Schools, the three people I'm most thankful for. Juan Melian, I've known over 20 years now. And um, he's as good a principal as exists in this country, but he's a better person. And what he gives to our kids inspires me to be better. Rosina Haskins, you want to know why that day was successful? I've known her now 13 days. She's never done anything that isn't successful. And the amount of hours and preparation that she did for that day um, make me want to work harder and do more. Joao, I would be wrong to not say that of every kid I've met in the past few years, nobody has inspired me more than him. And there's a time when I think as superintendent, I hear things from my own two kids. And... That keeps me going. I'm like, well, if this is happening, then we need to fix that. And I've had this question, when my kids aren't in school anymore, what does that do to my role as superintendent? How does that? Because it's been very powerful being superintendent where my kids are. Last year, Joao, um, because he doesn't just share with teachers. It was his first year in West Hartford. I do a program with the junior class in both high schools. Your daughter's been through it. And... Um, where we, I do mock interviews, and I talk about the college admissions process, about interviewing in life, about what trails you leave, and it's just me and the 350 kids from the class. And it's my favorite day of the year at both schools. And at Conard, three kids volunteered to come up and sit through mock interviews, two of your standard students and Joe Al. And for that auditorium, to hear him talk about what his day is like, versus theirs and what's going to come across as an interview you should know that i said to the kids there because i said where do you want to go joao you remember this and he said yukon and i said how many of you in the audience are applying to yukon about 150 hands went up then i asked how many of you would happily give up your spot for joao and those hands all stayed up because there is nobody i've met here he came to the country Hartford Public first, learned Spanish, just because, then learned English with his native Brazilian, played soccer, decided to learn to play saxophone, handles the bills, handles things that come up in New York City that he has to travel to for his family, works nights and weekends for his family, for our kids to see an experience like that, that's what's special about West Hartford. He's what's special about West Hartford. He doesn't just share it with the teachers. For our 350 kids in that auditorium, to hear his experience was amongst the most inspiring, if not the most inspiring thing I've ever sat through. So I want to say at this Thanksgiving time, and I almost actually put it, I'm thankful for him. And uh, he's just an incredible young man. So, thanks, Joao. Okay, don't get up yet. <laughs> <laughs> up in here. Hold on. All right, one final question. I think this is fantastic, and I have a question for all three of you, but mostly for Joao, and not to put you on the spot. So, something for you to think about and communicate back to us. How do we make it, now that we have put our minds towards how we make our schools more welcoming, how we make our staff and our schools more welcoming, how do we make our Board of Ed meetings more welcoming so that we can get participation from all kinds of families across town and helping us uh, make decisions that impact our students and families? So think about it, and you don't have to answer me now, but if you do have an answer now, I'll take it. Um, I don't have a... I have a quick answer, um, but I'll actually answer it, um, say more later. But I have I had two different experiences in high schools. One was in Hartford, and one in Connor High School. And in Hartford, I was I didn't have uh, a person such as Amanda Goler helping me and translating for my family or telling me the things that I can do, things that I have to do in school. If it wasn't for my mom. If it wasn't for my mom to fight for me to register me in school, I, I wouldn't even do my freshman year. <laughs> but Amanda, when I first got in Connor, Amanda, she, was, she helped with everything. I asked, I, I, I asked her, 
every single my mom my mom seems like my mom is still texting her I, like I'm not even kidding my mom I think it was <laughs> I'm not kidding 45 minutes ago my, my mom was asking her something about the registration for, for college for uh, my college and I think that we need more people like that because if it wasn't for her I, I'll be more, more really really lost and yeah, that's my quick answer well, <laughs> I'll see more later. His mom is watching right now. And if you ever get a chance to spend a day with him, visit him at Conard. Um, you have to see him in his element. He is just a ball of energy, excitement, and positive. Um, he just got such a positive demeanor. And um, he's just somebody that's so cool to hang around. And students say it, teachers say it. Um, Mr. Duarte said it to me again today. Um, and his mom is so proud of him. So. <laughs> So, Joel, you're forgetting something then. If your mom's watching, you got to. Do you mind if I sing Portuguese? Beijo, mãe, te amo. All right, thank you, all of you. All right, we're going to move on to our next presentation, um, computer science in the, in the curriculum. Thank you. And you have a tough act to follow. Uh, we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Deb. And I'll um, have Paul welcome everybody coming up. Michelle Gravelin, Jeff Wallowitz, and Jackie Coricelli. Um, I do want to say before they come about before they talk about this, and this will be focused on computer science in the classroom and the work we've been doing, and you know that we kicked the year off talking about how do we inculcate computer science more rather than it being a standalone. But I want to talk about one thing this, that's kind of come out of this that's a little bit separate, and it's that on February 12th this year, Tom Friedman wrote an article, The Two Codes Your Kids Need to Know. And for January through March, it was the most shared most commented on article in the New York Times. And um, the information really came out of discussions he had had with um, members from the college board that I know well. And it was about his posit was that um, there are two codes that all kids need to know. How the US Constitution works and how computers work. And those are the things we need to go know moving forward. And um, the College Board has developed these two courses, GOPO people call it, U.S. Government and Politics, that completely changed the way government and politics were. And it's about um, nine foundational documents and 15 court cases. And um, AP Computer Science. Um, they shifted both courses to make them not courses that you're building off of others. Their courses... Any child can take with the idea being this is a course that our kids will need. Because of West Hartford, I was actually asked to present right after Election Day in Washington, D.C. about the two codes with Stephanie Sanford, who is a White House fellow and now handles all government relations with the College Board, about the two codes and what it looks like in the classroom. Because West Hartford in Connecticut has the most kids taking those two courses. And that's without it being, we're a two codes district. This is, we're not telling kids to, this is what's happened. And that's because of people like Jag Corselli here, AP computer science teachers, who, because of her influence, um, we have many girls walking around Connor wearing shirts that look like this, that are the uh, Steminist, proudly Steminists. This is my daughter's, actually. Um, more perspectives, more possibilities. And we've looked at the AP Computer Science course, just so you know, over time, which they're going to talk about, but it's the fastest growing course in demographics for African American students and Hispanic students in the country. And um, female representation in the course has um, gone up 2,000% over the past five years. Um, but it's a course that it's important, not just that we offer, that it's accessible to all sorts of students because as I said at convocation when I discuss with graduates were you prepared for school I always get I was so much prepared in college than the people from here 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 
But over the past couple of years, I keep getting this, except for in this class when I had to do coding, except for in this class when I had to do coding. So one of the things we're really trying to do is demystify computer science in the curriculum from, oh, I'm a computer science person to really how do we get all people into this? And it happens on all levels. So I'll turn it over to Polly now. That was an outstanding introduction. And Thanks. I tell you, I never, ever in my life like to follow Dr. Haskins and certainly don't want to follow Joelle ever again. But <laughs> if not for this topic, I'm, I'm so excited to be able to present on computer science and, and uh, the excitement that's around it, as Tom just very uh, aptly described. Uh, and I'm also extremely proud to welcome to the table, um, really, this group of leaders that uh, drive the work. So uh, to my left is Dr. Michelle Graveline. She is our department supervisor for mathematics, but she has really helped to drive vision on computer science in the secondary level um, over the last several years. Some of the statistics that you read about in the, uh, in the board report are, are due really to a lot of effort on her part and the part of her teachers. Of course, Jeff Wallowitz, our principal on special assignment, who we lean on heavily here as we think about how do we bring computer science in, in that mindset into our elementary schools and how do we do it uh, efficiently, how do we do it with finesse, how do we do it with excitement for our students. Um, last and certainly not least is Jackie Coruscelli, who is not only an, uh, an AP computer science teacher at Conard High School, she is uh, the quintessential leader in the field of computer science. She is huge in the computer science community uh, and a name that is known not only in Connecticut but uh, is known nationally based on the work that she's doing. So um, if you'll put up with me for a few minutes to give my commentary, I will let these experts speak to any questions that you'll have after a short presentation. Um, and we'll really just talk quickly through how computer science aligns to our district mission, kind of what it is and why it's important. Um, and, and then uh, I'd be remiss if anything that we're doing in the district, if we're not talking about how do we do this with equity in mind? How do we build this so that we're not having to go backward and address any opportunity gaps that exist through some systemic fault in our designs? Um, so uh, our mission, quite simply, to begin, uh, is to inspire and prepare all students. And at times we need, to, we need to be cognizant of what are we preparing students for. We're preparing them um, not for a future that's tomorrow. We're preparing them for a future that already arrived yesterday. And quite honestly, as a country, as a state, as a district, we are behind the power curve. We just simply are relative to computer science. Um, and, and the reason for that and the reason for really any systemic change that's occurred in society uh, can, can often be pointed back to some really big, um, whether they're inventions or things that come about, some in, you know, individual moments. So in the 1400s, the, uh, the uh, invention of the printing press. And prior to that time, I'm sure you know that any, any material that was produced, and all of the knowledge that was held in books, all of the publishing that was done, was done painstakingly by hand by monks and, and was very expensive. And therefore, the keepers of the knowledge were the noble class and the church, and that was it. And the printing press was the thing that distributed knowledge and gave rise to, to really the, uh, the scientific um, the age of science. Um, it was the 1800s with the, with the uh, development of the combustible engine that gave rise to the Industrial Revolution and made all of that laborious work uh, that people had been doing was able to be done more efficiently, uh, more cost-effectively uh, by machine. Um, it is the times that we're living in now and the birth of the Internet that has totally reshaped uh, our world, not, not just in terms of how we communicate with each other and all those societal changes, but economically, when you think about what it's done to the brick and mortar stores. Right? And it is the rise of artificial and blockchain, intel uh, blockchain technology that is having a dramatic effect on our trust companies, um, on our banking, on our finance, um, and is going to change really how things are happening. So it's, it's something, uh, computer science, it's something that we have to understand. It's something that we have to make sure that we have a current vision of and not the vision from our own 
educational experience. I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm old enough that I did take a computer science course when I was in high school, and it was using uh, cardboard card key punching cards, holes into cards to run programs. Um, and then it was really cool in my senior year that we got to learn a little program called BASIC. All right, but uh, the, the vision of what computer science was then versus what it is today and what it needs to be for tomorrow is something that we need to keep up front in our minds. So I'd like to kind of hit three big, uh, three big myths that are out there. Um, first, this concept that computer science is somehow vocational versus foundational. Uh, con Tom spoke to it when he talked about the two codes, the notion that coding or computer science needs to become a fourth literacy. It needs to become, some, become something that every student needs to know about. Computer science is not just for computer programmers. In the same way that when we think about other things, other pieces of knowledge that we want to guarantee every student have, uh, the founding documents that Tom spoke about. Uh, they're not just for historians or history majors. Uh, we expect every student to come away with some basic understanding of photosynthesis, right? But we're not preparing everyone to be botanists. Uh, we expect every student to know something about linear and exponential growth in order to have a walking around knowledge in the world, but we're not preparing every student to be a mathematician. In the same way, computer science, there are foundational elements that every student needs to know and understand. Um, Computer science is not just about technology. It's not about basic, like I said, or visual basic, or turbo Pascal, or C++, or Java, which are some of the languages. Language is just the tools. Um, the goal is not to be this informed user or consumer of technology, but a creator of technology. And there's a vast difference between technological literacy, which is something that we chased in the 90s, to computational thinking, which is really at the root of what computer science is. Um, and it's also important to understand that it's not just about STEM, and that's really what this graphic uh, intends to display. We get a lot of help and support, even from the Oval Office, talking about the importance of STEM and STEM fields. Um, but you see that while 67% of all new jobs that are in STEM itself are actually in computing, only 10% of STEM graduates um, have degrees in computer science. And to have the local look at that in Connecticut, right now there are over 5,000 jobs open this last year for, uh, that deal with computing and computer science, and we had only 533 graduates uh, in 2017 in that field. So that 10% notion, we're only producing 10% of qualified people for a job market. So it's something that we need to pay attention to. Um, as we said, it's not, so what is it about if it's not just about technology? Well, it's about, it's about problem solving. You know, when we think about, uh, I, I use this phrase, um, computational thinking, uh, at the end of the day is the, is the, under, and the definition that was provided in your board report. It's for you to understand that, uh, computer science or computational thinking, which is at the roots of that, is a problem solving process that involves logic, it involves ordering and analyzing data, and it involves creating solutions around ordered steps or algorithms. Right? It's about dispositions, habits of mind, perseverance, um, the ability to deal with complexity and open-ended problems, to engage in productive struggle, to try to learn from failure, to, to likely be working with a team. Um, and it's about connections, because again, it's not just about those 5,000 computing jobs. It has connections in math, science, and humanities um, all around the place. And you say, well, that's great. But what do you mean you want to look at this all the way down in elementary? Because truth be told, we have, a, we have a fairly strong program in high school. We have a budding program in the middle school. Our goal is to push this all the way down into pre-K and K. Um, and, and I'll share this, and I share this graphic because uh, it's a reminder of a song, Old MacDonald Had a Farm, a song that, that toddlers will learn as early as pre-K or K. And, and if you think about the learning process, if you ever thought about the lyrics to that song, it's quite a long song. You do three, four, but, but you can get kindergartners to learn that in about 10, 15 minutes, and they can break out with multiple verses. And you say, well, how did they learn it? And they learned it through a lot of the same principles that we would want them to learn and understand relative to computer science, this concept of computational thinking, this concept that students learn 
uh, best through understanding and observation of patterns, um, through understanding of sequencing, um, and, and you break the song down, it does have ordered steps to it, it does have loops that repeat, it does have branches that come off as you introduce new animals into the song. It is sequenced in a particular way, demonstrating patterns that are very quickly observed, ascertained, and learned by the students, not through memorization. Not the same way that they have to learn how to read even, when they have to think about, oh, first I have to be able to identify the letters, then I have to be able to match a sound to that letter, then I can begin to pick up words and, so, and then I learn sight. None of, none of that, not as much simpler in essence. Um, and it's that brand of thinking uh, that we want to find ways to integrate into our teaching um, and, and make the connections, quite honestly, that are already there. And as we build it, we have to think about equity of opportunity. Um, looking at computer science at the national level, uh, it has traditionally been a field uh, that has been dominated by males and that does not reflect diversity in terms of race or ethnicity. Um, and I pulled some, some additional data beyond what was there in those statistics in the report um, to talk about, well, well, how do we fare currently? Uh, it is our effort that we will build this with equity in mind, and, and I think I, some of the statistics can talk about how we're succeeding with that and shine some lights on where we still have work to go. So as a district at our high schools, and I'll talk specifically about our high school programming, we have a range of courses currently that we offer. Um, we have 48% females in our high schools. Uh, we have 26% females participating in uh, a variety of computer science offerings this current year. So work to be done for us there. Um, what's promising is if we look at our Exploring Computer Science, which is a course that's uh, more generally open, open to freshmen, or it's really open enrollment to any students. We are we, we do have a greater distribution of females there. We have 35 percent, so we're doing 10 percent better in that course. Still work to be done. And when we look at our AP courses, we're at 27 percent. So it's work to be done. When we look at students of color, um, at our high schools, our high schools are, uh, relative to ethnicity are 27 percent diverse. We have 28 percent students of color currently enrolled in uh, our array of courses for computer science. So we're very glad about that. And in exploring computer science, it actually jumps up to 55% according to the statistics I've looked at. Uh, but there's work to be done in our AP, because in AP it's only 15%. So this is, this is, this is an area that, that we'll talk about. It's not a unique problem to West Hartford, quite honestly. Uh, I know these folks can talk about this because they have that national lens uh, that we're doing quite better than most places we're doing. but but it's something that we're committed to as we build this. So um, in closing, really, uh, the purpose of tonight's report is to announce this as a major initiative for the district. Uh, our goal in this current year uh, is to work with a team, a small district team for which uh, the folks here are members and there are other members not currently represented. Uh, we have some a number of professional development opportunities that we're sending folks to, and our goal is to walk away with really a vision statement and, and the framework of a plan that will begin enacting over the course of the next three to five years um, with broad access available to all students at all levels, with connections that stem down into our elementary schools, uh, bolstering the programming we already have established in our middle and high schools and expanding it, significant professional development for, um, for teachers, and as we develop our plan, an understanding of what responsible uh, resourcing will entail. So, Jackie, could you talk a little bit about um, some of your national work and where, it, where West Hartford fits with that? Just um... I'll try to stay out of the weeds. Um, so I was, I'm really honored, I was a, um, chosen as an equity fellow. So I, I won the equity fellowship award for the CST. It's the first of its kind. Um, it was one of, t I was one of 10 teachers chosen and I'm the only one from New England. Um, the whole point of the fellowship is to put us in contact with the nine other teachers and also a really amazing set of resources through the Computer Science Teachers Association, the CSTA. 
<clears throat> to be able to advocate for change locally and then to bring that change back to the national conference and talk about it there. Um, and the change I'd really like to focus on is uh, getting us involved with a program called SCRIPT. SCRIPT is a set of K through 12 rubrics to be able to help the district to be able to get training. That's the team that Paul was speaking a little bit about. Um, and also to attend as a facilitator so that us and other people who have um, become facilitators will be able to help other districts to move forward. So um, the idea of the advocating I want to do is not just here, but also in Connecticut, and then again to advocate for change nationally. And I just wanted to kind of bring that back home. I, I was educated in Connecticut. I grew up here. Um, and I left for three years to work at Raytheon, but I, I never took a computer science course. I didn't actually know really what it was. I enjoyed programming my graphing calculator for fun, but I really didn't know that that was programming or computer science. I graduated from UConn, same thing. I really didn't know what the courses were. And frankly, when you're putting money on the table and I was the first female in my family to go to college, you're not going to put money on something you're not sure on. <clears throat> so when I graduated and someone from Raytheon offered me a job and they said, how would you like to know how a fax machine works? I was like, sure, that sounds cool. And um, that was how I accepted that position. I didn't, I knew that they were defense contractors, but I didn't, I didn't really know the history of the, um, the institution. And um, I was so uh, blown away by the teaching I received there. And I really try hard to channel and help people in the way that those really amazing teachers helped me to learn what is this computer science thing. But I really had to learn it on the job. And so it is really near and dear to my heart that our students don't have to work that hard. And um, really, I'm trying to, there's no student that shouldn't feel like they sh are too, af no good decisions are made based on fear. <laughs> And I think the institution, the American institution of education, really stands on fixing that. <laughs> and so I feel extremely passionately about this whole computer science thing. I have an 11-year-old daughter. It should not be unusual for her to take computer science. And when I got into this, she was two. And it still, sadly, is unusual. It should not be unusual for any student to study this thing. It should just be expected. And I'm really so proud to, I'm actually really moved to be sitting at this table and to be talking about this here, because I know if any group of people can do this, can fix it for our kids, it's us. Um, and so that's the equity fellowship thing. The other, the other hat I wear is I'm a consultant for AP Computer Science Principles, so I teach teachers. Um, and AP Computer Science Principles is the course that's really working to um, you know, fix some of the equity issues on terms of College Board. I also um, am really connected through the CSTA. I'm the vice president of the Computer Science Teachers Association. And um, so a anything I can do <laughs> from wearing all those hats, um, I'm really happy to do. But I'm just so proud of us. I think this is really cool. Yeah. Is that... Okay. So Tom, you, got, <clears throat> you kind of alluded to this. Uh, my oldest is a senior, so my, my group is expanding. Because when uh, I've been on the board for a while now, and I often talk to graduates of uh, our high schools and say, how has college prepared, how has our school prepared you for college? And I always get the same answer, and I'm proud of that answer. Is you know, very good. We're ahead of our peers, typically, this, that, the other thing. And we're talking about great schools. Um, but you alluded to this. So we had a student go to, um, to Dartmouth last year. Um, he's he, Actually, he's a freshman this year. I'm sorry. Um, brilliant kid. Uh, hard worker, obviously. Um, they're on tri-semester, so he doesn't have to take that many classes um, for that tri-semester. And one of them is computer science. And he is struggling through it. And um, I didn't expect to hear that. I expected to hear the same answer I always hear. And, and you kind of alluded a little bit to this, that computer science. Um, and, and I found that um, puzzling because um, obviously he got into a great school and uh, came from a great school. Uh, but I guess there was that link. Because again, when I remember computer science in college, um, I guess it was basic and, and um, Wow, it's I'm going back, you know, but uh, it was relatively easy back then. It's not now, and uh, it it's um, it's apparent. So this is this is very encouraging. Is basically what I'm getting at is that you know that same 
kid going to Dartmouth or any other school in this country a um, few years from now will not say, yeah, hey, Mr. Zidano, it's, it, it's a breeze, you know, and he's taking that computer science class as well. So this is uh, very encouraging. The challenge is that, well, and like we said, this is kind of a three-year goal to how do we do this rollout, and Jeff's spending a lot of the years studying, thinking about it. And Jeff, do you want to talk about the challenge of adding to the elementary curriculum and why that's a problem, really? Uh, so hi, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for having me here. It's, it's great to be here tonight. Um, yeah, so, so the, the thought of, of putting one more thing on an elementary teacher's plate or an elementary principal's plate is, is um, scary to even suggest. Um, so, so Tom's vision is, is, is really um, what's driving this and making this um, not just meaningful but so manageable. Because um, when you think about computational thinking, um, it, it's a way of approaching a problem. It's not an add-on. Um, I don't know what your knowledge base is um, in regard to computational thinking, but it's, it's really just four elements. It's um, decomposition, taking a complex problem and breaking it down into meaningful chunks. It's about um, pattern recognition, recognizing the similarities and the differences with what you're looking at. Um, it's it's um, looking at abstraction, um, weeding through the extraneous information and getting to the heart of the information we need. And then it's the algorithmic thinking um, of how we build those steps to solve that problem. You do that pre-K-5, any content area, including specials. So we're not talking about an add-on. We're talking about a different way of thinking, a different way of approaching a problem that you can do with four-year-olds, three-year-olds, all the way through, no matter what content area the teachers are teaching. Um, so that's when it becomes less scary, because now it's not what are we adding on, it's how are we framing our thinking, and how are we approaching problems, how are we approaching the, curric the curriculum. And I'd say, to be accurate, we're at the point of scary right now. I mean, we this is something we have to sell to our own community, to our own teaching staff, to our own, because we're all nervous about, I've got to teach something that I don't know how to do. That is really the, but we've got to, so we've got to look at a needs assessment just like we did before, but we've also got to kind of demystify this in the way Jeff just explained. Thank you very much for the presentation and for how you explained everything, and especially, sir, the last comments that you made, because I admit I'm one of those persons where it's like, whoa, that's a language I just don't quite understand. But when you explain it in the way that you did, it really helps to make it more of a universal language that certainly relates to all of us. In particular, in the material, I very much appreciate where you commented that as a discipline, computer science is grounded in logic, problem solving, and creativity. It is designed to teach students to think differently about problems they are attempting to solve in any context. And that's something that all of us can relate to, because how many of us live a problem-free life? If you do, please write a book, and you will be very successful. And so recognizing this is something that certainly appeals to all of us, I thank you, and especially with that being something implemented in our curriculum for our younger students on up. So thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I, I can't, I'm on, I'm on board, let, let me say that first. I teach, I've been certified to teach the other course that Tom mentioned, the AP government course, so I know how challenging it is to get kids on board with you. Um, I have a, a lot of questions for you. So what can we do to remove the hesitancy that students face? For example, um, when I first went around to try and get kids to take an AP class, um, we got three or four sections, and it took the students a year to trust me until we got about seven or something like that, um, because they they wanted to see who the teacher was, what was the class like, was the curriculum hard, how many hours of homework will I get? Um, so a few questions. What are we doing outside of AP? And then secondly, what are we doing outside of the curriculum so students can practice the skills that they've learned? And I, I don't know a lot about the curriculum. I took I learned Pascal in high school. And, and a lot of if-then statements, um, and then I uh, dropped out of a C-plus class because I said, this is not for me. So what, what are we doing, um, you know, to get kids to take the hard classes, to get t kids to challenge themselves outside of AP, and what are we doing with extracurriculars or anything else that you can think of? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Michelle to start, um, but I wanted to say one thing first. The, the story that Jackie told about, you know, when she went to Raytheon and didn't have computer science. It reminded me, it's exactly how my sister does some work. And 
unfortunately, that's like been a norm where, where folks might have landed in a computer science job and not had the formal pr uh, preparation. But uh, Dr. Graveline has been doing, with Jackie, has been doing amazing work to open doors to computer science. So I'm going to have her, have her talk about how she's done that at Connor. Good evening, everybody. Um, your, your question is, is, a, is a great one um, because we started this journey at the top with the AP Computer Science A course. It just happened that way. Um, and, and Jackie was teaching it that very first year. And she, she can tell you more about the kids literally when we got approval from the curriculum office to offer the course, kids jumping literally up and down in, in Conard hallways. Um, they were so excited about it. Um, but we, what we click, quickly noticed was that we were, our lens was always equity from the beginning. Um, and, and so we needed to broaden the base by which kids were able to access that course. Um, and so then, just by the nature of being able to partner with Hartford in a grant, um, we were able to bring Exploring Computer Science um, to the district, which is a completely open access course. Um, it requires very little math prereq uh, in order to, to access the course. And so, as Jackie likes to say, um, it's, it's the course we want kids who aren't going to get a computer under their Christmas tree um, to be able to understand that they can do it. Anyone can do it. Um, they just need the right person and the right curriculum. Uh, and that's what that course offers. And so once we got the two um, ends, if you will, the two bookends, we needed something in the middle because what we were realizing was that wasn't enough if you had absolutely no experience with computer science. It wasn't enough to bridge that gap. And so last year we started um, cryptography, a cryptography course, which is a semester course. Um, and that's starting, it's too soon to say, um, but that's, that's our hope, is that that course will be able to get kids to um, AP Computer Science A. AP Computer Science Principles is a very open access course. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I don't have so much a, a question as just a comment. Um, and as Mr. Payson said, I, I'm on board. I fully support you and I trust that we have the right people doing this. I do think you're going to you have a long road ahead um, because when we were talking about the equity pieces, we know how important it is to have the adults in the community do that work over a long period of time before we can best facilitate the work with our kids. So in some ways, I, I can see how it, how imperative it's going to be to help us understand it as parents in the community to say, you know, what does this look like? You know, when you're giving the example in the elementary school. I can hear, you know, parents saying, well, if they're, are they already doing it? Are they going to sing more songs? You know, what does it look like? Do, is it an add-on course? How does it get incorporated? Um, does your child have to choose something else to do this? Or, like, well, how, do, how does that work? So I think that that's going to be exciting for us as parents and as a board to see what you come up with as far as getting the parents and the adults in the town comfortable with what does this actually look like? What are these... You know, when as we're talking about career exposure as the kid, kids get older, when they're thinking about computational thinking, I think that phrase is really powerful because it gets you out of that mindset of, I'm going to be a computer scientist. Computational thinking, I think, is a much easier thing to grasp as someone who's really uncomfortable with math and science or for people who just get very nervous about those topics. Um, so I guess I, I'm excited for that learning as we go through this to just see more applications and examples and just helping us visualize what this is more clearly. I can share a couple of specifics. Um, one of my good friends does a lot of work in Virginia and one of the things she has a son who is dyslexic much older now um, but one of the things that she found it was for our students that maybe learn a little differently, they maybe struggle with writing in English. A way to help and support them with the structure of writing can be to do code. Because he, he, um, Jeff was mentioning sequence selection iteration. So sequ sequences that stuff needs to be in an order. Selection, the conditional statements. If this is true, then that. Um, and iteration is looping. And so uh, it doesn't matter what essay you're writing, for sure there's a sequence to it. There's um, looping, you're re repeating the point that you're trying to make the thesis statement or whatever. And then um, 
if conditionals, often you're kind of winding your reader through an argument. And so she found that for dyslexic students, writing in code helped them to then structure a essay in English, which is kind of a cool take on things because they're dragging and dropping and less focused on the mechanics of the grammar and all that. So that's one really specific example. Another is, um, you know, all of our students have logons and um, passwords that they're creating. So um, rather than the passwords being created you know, through the district, we could support our elementary school students um, in creating passwords that are good, that are secure. And there's a method to that to make sure that they're using these secure passwords. So just basic cybersecurity, how are they staying safe online? How are they protecting their name online, never sharing their last name? Some of those basic concepts can really help them. Um, so those are, does that help? Okay. <laughs> It does, because this is, it's very exciting, and hearing the conversations down in the legislative building about all of the ways that we're working on workforce equity and women in science and, and STEM and STEAM and all the things that we know are really urgent, um, it's just how do you get the adults in the community to understand it in a way that, because the kids are going to be fine, it's just that way the adults are just as excited as the kids, so I'm looking forward to hearing about it. I just wanted to make a quick comment. Um, I do think with regard to the equity piece, I think it's wonderful to have the two of you um, as the, the leaders um, in our district to kind of lead us, um, because being the mom of a math and science daughter, um, I do still think that, um, just as Joelle was saying, it's really important to see someone like you um, up in front of that classroom teaching the course. So. Thank you for doing this. Um, it was really nice to hear you talk about the formulaic writing. Uh, we've, we've been using that, and it's been really successful with, with students uh, with disabilities or students that just don't like writing. Um, but this, this might be more for Tom, but feel free to comment in. Um, so in social studies, we house a few courses that might be a little different, like economics, for example, and I would be terrified to teach that. Uh, psychology, maybe to a lesser degree, and um, it sounds like it's in the math department. Uh, would it be, if we value it this much, is it dangerous to take it out of the math department? Is it, should we keep it there? Is this an FTE thing that we should be worried about? Because it sounds like we, we, we really might want to put more into this. So I don't, I don't know if you can comment on it or? Yeah, Paul and I, we were going through our curriculum. We sat down, was it yesterday? Um, for about two hours going through curriculum budget and how do we look at this? So that, yes, you're right. We If you're gonna do something, you need to invest in it. Right. And how do we move it forward? You're exactly right. The certification, I'm curious, because I haven't talked to you about this yet, Jackie, because so computer science certification for teachers is a little bit different and it's there's been stops and starts nationally as they do this because the problem is a lot of the people that are teaching it that may be great at it that have been teaching it for tw you know five years ten years they might not have been computer science majors and so if you create now a certification on a field that didn't really exist, what happens to those people teaching it? Um, and that's something the state's discussing right now. I was actually at the legislative for CAPS. We discussed it two weeks ago about we have to be careful about how this moves forward. And I don't know if well, let me Michelle let me start, and I'll have. Uh, I, know, I know they have stuff they can add. First, first and foremost, John, um, it is already shared across uh, not only our mathematics department but our uh, CTE department. Um, so. Uh, Jackie teaches uh, AP Computer Science Principles at Connors. She also teaches AP CSA, which is the programming course. Uh, there's another teacher at Connors that is certified to teach AP Computer Science Principles that's taught in the past, just based on the number of sections. She has a counterpart over at Hall who's in the CTE department that teaches the programming course. Um, and, and Tom is exactly correct that the, uh, the certification as it lives today uh, really opens up the opportunity to teach the course across math, science, uh, and CTE departments. However, Jackie and I had the good opportunity, good fortune, to serve on a committee with the State Department of Education where they were looking at 
what the um, what the assessment was going to be that they were going to use to determine eligibility for new certification requirements. So maybe she could talk a little bit about that. And then I know Michelle has done a dramatic amount of work with professional development teachers in her department, enabling them to teach a variety of courses, things that they didn't necessarily have that formalized training for in college, uh, but there's just some outstanding, some outstanding PD. So I'm sure they can both add on to that. So I've been a member of the CS advisory group for the State Department of Education since 2011 or something. Um, so we uh, were part of the position statement, the original State Board of Education position statement, and now uh, we were. I was part of the group of people suggesting the standards be adopted and also part of the group of people working to pass this legislation that just passed. So um, it was cool, really amazing to see the, the praxis get approved through the State Department of Ed. Um, and I can sort of speak where they're heading, um, but nothing is 100% determined. Uh, right now, what they're really working to do is try to keep as many doors open as possible for te teachers to be able to teach. Um, I think one of the strengths in West Hartford is that we do include more than one department. I ideally, I would love to see it in all departments. Computer science, it really does transcend. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in terms of where the certifications are going, um, what they're trying to do, it, what, what they're going to do is if somebody is able to pass this praxis, K through 12, then they would be certified to teach it. And so even without the courses. Now, part of the legislation is that every teacher will get uh, an experience with computer science, and they're working like Southern, for example, has a pretty specific program even worked out for teachers to who are trying to become a computer science teacher, that program does exist, and they've got a pr like a pathway for teachers to be able to do that. Um, and then again, pass the praxis. So that's sort of the goal at the end of that thing. But for now, for teachers that are teaching, they would have to either take the courses, and I think it's 10 or 12 credits that are detailed on the website for the State Department of Ed, um, or they need to pass that praxis exam. You, you happened to mention the um, social studies history. Our, our intention for the cryptography course is um, to hopefully have it be a course that's, that's duly taught by a social studies um, and a, a math teacher um, to bring that historical lens of when the coding pra practices changed and um, what historical events were going on at the time and what precipitated them. Um, in terms of what Paul was talking about with the PD, um, when we were uh, doing the PD for exploring computer science, uh, there were actually teacher English teachers. You know, Jackie had mentioned the the coding and, and writing process being very similar. Um, they had an English teacher who was teaching AP computer science principles and was now there to be trained for the exploring computer science. So. Um, it's, it's wide open. It, it's just a matter of, of the teacher being open um, to, to learning more. And, and luckily, most of our teachers are like that. So um, I, I, see it, I see it creeping out everywhere. It will come up a little more in January when we present on 25 credits. So we have to shift, and that it'll actually be policy that will go through for graduation from 21 and 3 quarter credits in West Hartford for 25 credits. Not that this is a state directive. Now, the issue with it is the requirements in math goes to your question. Yeah. So it's always the kind of, do we want this to be in lieu of a senior course, or do we want both? I can make an argument that there is coding as an art that would go through that people might argue with. But no, we've got to be open-minded about this. But how the state allows articulation is something that that's it's tenuous and there's a lot of questions just in how we credit our kids that you're all going to have to grapple with over the next six months to a year and we'll talk about that more in january uh sorry tom just uh, basically alluded to what i was worried about which was you know increasing graduation requirements uh do we have enough room to to expand should there be a student interest uh so thank you for all your answers Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to item seven, routine matters. And first is the financial report. 
the approval of the financial report for the period ending October 31st, 2019. And the recommendation is that the board approve the financial report for the period ending October 31st, 2019. And we're going to have uh, Rob walk us through our financial report this week, this month. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. So if you want to follow along, we're on page 14. Uh, you'll see this is as of October 31st, so just two months into the year. Um, for our new folks, you know, we look at this every year. It's a little bit premature to make too many assumptions when we're so close to starting um, into the fiscal year. But you'll see um, on page 14 that there's um, salaries, there's a $25,000 discrepancy. Again, just a couple months into the year, you can look over on page 15 at some of the uh, 5,000 line items to see where the, um, the discrepancies lie. Uh, these have varying reasons as far as whether there's a vacancy that they're looking to fill, where you'll see that there's a positive balance to um, where, there, where there's overages. Can, it's, um, again, early in the year, so these things generally smooth out over the course of the fiscal year. Um, under benefits, you'll see the other benefit costs, that there's a $250,000 um, positive. Uh, again, for the new folks, uh, the majority of the board uh, back, back in the spring, as you may recall, the governor had a, a, a wonderful idea of possibly making the different districts uh, pay for part of the teacher pension. Um, that is out there that is looming that is that is underfunded so uh west hartford's uh hit on that was a little over half a million dollars uh, the majority of the board felt that we should put something in there it never came to fruition in this year uh, we'll have to see going forward so that's why we have a two hundred fifty thousand dollar kind of um, surplus sitting out there for that <clears throat> and then um right below that under purchase services you'll see that we're um, not quite where we're, we want to be with the transportation and other services. Again, it's early in the year, so you know they they you know they, they plan these budgets over uh, an annual cycle, so those things are expected to balance out. The only concern that you should probably have, uh, even though it's early, is that everything. If you look at the general fund balance again, at the bottom of page 14, it's showing that everything is is copacetic on you know, that it's zeroed out but it's relying on that $250,000 that really shouldn't be there um, because it, it's money that was supposed to be earmarked for something that we don't uh, technically need this year so as we go into the year we hope that we don't continue to see that kind of um, discrepancy because at some point then it's like well wh where are we going to balance are we going to use the 250 that was intended for another purpose or what are we going to do? So it's just something to keep an eye on. We're only, again, we're only two months into the year. So it's nothing to be overly concerned about at this point, but I do think as we get into budget season, it'll be interesting to see at that point, once we're about halfway through the year, how these numbers are shaking out at that point. Any questions on that part? <laughs> and then state and federal grants, you'll see that there's a line right in the middle on page 16 between uh, fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 19. The reason that there are some grant balances in 20 is that these are two-year grants typically. So not all the money for the 20 grants is gonna be used this year. Some of it's gonna follow into 2021. And then under 19, you'll see everything does um, get used as it is in the second year of those grants. <clears throat> um, under the special funds report, uh, everything is pretty much status quo. Uh, as far as where the um, the balances are and where we're where we're expected to be going forward through the end of the year, uh, and then the last part on page 18, which is generally everyone's favorite part, nutrition services. Um, again, for the new folks, this is a, a dramatic turnaround from when I first came on a couple years ago, where we were always looking at shortfalls. So uh, I don't think we can give enough kudos to um, the director there and all, all of his supports to really turning this program around to where it is a, a revenue generator now versus a, a negative uh, type of thing for our budget. So, and, and the Levine family children do their part in that regard. Um, 
writing checks all the time, it seems like. So uh, in all seriousness, though, that's pretty much it. If there's any questions, um, the expert is sitting at that table. Okay, thank you. I guess I'll be looking for a motion to approve the financial report for the period ending October 31st. Is there a second? Second. Um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Abstentions? The ayes have it. Motion passes. Next item under routine matters is approval of the minutes. Thank you, Liz. Um, approval of the minutes from the November 19th, 2019 regular Board of Education meeting. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the minutes of the regular Board of Education meeting of November 19th. Is there a motion? So moved. And a second? Uh, any discussion? If not, all those in favor of approval of the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Abstentions, the ayes have it, minutes are approved. Moving to section eight, information and reports. Um, section A, board members, communications and reports. Are there any reports from other boards and organizations? Uh, Lorna. Good evening uh, once again. So I'm sure we all recall how this Friday was Black Friday and Saturday was Small Business Saturday and Monday was Cyber Monday. Well, today is Giving Tuesday. So what a wonderful opportunity to draw attention to a wonderful organization that we have here within our own town, the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools, which we certainly know serves our students and teachers very, very, very well in terms of providing grants and fundings for programs that help to create the, the learning lesson even more so beyond the classroom for our students. So certainly want to give a shout out to the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools and want to encourage all of you, if you're able to, to contribute. Uh, and when you're contributing, remember that when you are giving, you're giving and you're paying yourself. In other words, that money is investing in our young people and that's coming back to us. And that's like the ultimate kind of investment. So certainly want to encourage for that to take place. Also want to encourage for you to follow uh, the foundation on Facebook and Twitter and certainly like their posts. There certainly are wonderful posts that are made. And even more so, if some of you are wondering, well, what kind of grants are, are being out there? How, how are young people benefiting from them? Well, you have an opportunity to learn more because you can view episodes of the Foundation Presents, which is on WHCI, West Hartford Community Interactive. And there you will see interviews of different board, uh, interviews by a board member of the Foundation who interviews teachers, students, and community members about different grants that have been put out there. So if you want to see how your money is being put to use, you can certainly see it live. But please do consider giving to the Foundation, not just because today is Giving Tuesday, that certainly they will accept any contributions year round beyond today. <laughs> Thank you. Any other reports? Mark? Well, since the student reps aren't here, I had the privilege of attending um, a race in the Bronx, and although I'm a hall dad, um, Gavin Cherry from Conard came in second in, I think, all of New England, Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, um, like from the mid Midwest or mid Atlantic all the way up. So I think this so is a Northeast region, and he placed second and will be going out to California. Um, in San Diego for in the national race. So he qualified for the national race. So uh, kudos to him. Okay, we don't have any other information and discussions. Uh, Non-staff communications and reports. We don't have the reports from the student board representatives tonight. So moving on to future business. Uh, future meeting dates. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, December 17th, two weeks from tonight here um, in the legislative chamber at 7 p.m. In your agenda booklet, you'll see that we have a board workshop scheduled for Tuesday, January 7th. We are working to reschedule that board workshop, so stay tuned for more information about that. We'll look to reschedule that for a different date in January. And uh, finally, our next meeting after December 17th, will be Tuesday, January 21st, 2020, a uh, regular Board of Education meeting and a presentation of the SIP, the Capital Improvement Plan. That'll be here in the Legislative Chamber at 7 p.m. Do we have any requests for future agenda items? 
Uh, I know we have uh, a number of things that are set for the months coming up, but at some point when it makes sense, um, it would be great to hear a presentation similar to the ones we have here about our library services and just to understand you know, what they look like from elementary to middle to high school and um, just to hear from some of the uh, librarians at those levels too, that would be great. Okay. Great, anyone else? Okay, thank you for that. Are there any comments from visitors remaining in the room? All right, and we do not have an executive session, so I will look for a motion to adjourn. Second? Second. Well, meeting is adjourned. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>